Hi. Is this going to be shown anywhere or is this going to be Yeah, right here. In an uncomfy um, professional setting. Right. So, Nate, how are we looking over there? Are we about ready to start? Huh? Yeah. Oh, this is the beginning? Is this? You're kicking it off. This is Have I been kicking it off for the past 45 seconds? Sorry. Yeah. Hi. How's it going, everybody? My name is Mike Salmon. Welcome to the crypto shit. Shit. I'm sorry. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Crypto Integrity Show. What are we calling it? Just integrity. That's what we're doing. Welcome to the Crypto Shit Show, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, actually, no, it is called integrity, and that's a. Uh... Look, we'll just start like this. I mean, I figure I dress this way to look nice and professional to give you guys an idea of exactly what to expect here. I'm sorry about having my bare feet in front of you guys. <laughs> I got nice feet. Same. But fuck, you know. I got that second long toe. Anybody else have that? Yeah. It's a sign of intelligence. I'm just pointing that out. I didn't write, I didn't write any jokes about it. I'm wearing a white beater, though. That's like an acceptable name for this shirt. Still. <laughs> I got a white beater. Yeah. I must be his wife. Like, that doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. I used to think, and we, Nate and I actually had a conversation about this. Uh, I used to think, like, because it's kind of shaped like a, like a basketball jersey. It's the first time I've ever heard of this. And if you're not from Philadelphia, you might not get this part, but I don't really give a shit. There's a shitty neighborhood called Kensington. And I, they were always called the Kensington White Beaters. So I just thought like the Reading Phillies or like just like it was a baseball team. Like, oh, that must be the White Beaters jersey. <laughs> that was weird. All right. Now that we the White Beater jokes out of the way, my name's Mike Salvi. I'm a comic from Philly. And uh, listen, this place is nuts. I got to address the fact that Vegas is just already wild. Um, I didn't know that, I really didn't know that there's legal marijuana here until I like, got off the plane. I'm a big marijuana smoker. Uh, not just like an advocate, I just like it a lot. And uh, I think it's great. I will say this, um, and somebody in this room did ask me earlier, and it's just a weird thing, like, I'm not the only guy with weed in Nevada right now. You know that? Like, you could just go get it, you could order it, it's 2018, they'll just bring it here. Um, and you should, all right, so let's, Two nights ago, we're standing out on the strip, and we're smoking this joint. And this guy came up to me, and he was like, hey, do you mind, like, do you mind if I smoke that way? And I was like, you don't want to smoke this, I have herpes. I don't really have herpes. Wait a minute, but it's not showing. Anyway, I, so, I said, no, you don't want this, I have herpes. And without even blinking, he goes, simplex one or simplex two? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know there's that much of a difference where like some dude on the street who's fucking trash and shirtless could tell me like, look, well, they have one or two. There's a difference? I don't think I have either one. Uh, a little bit about me, um, so people want to know how I got like, it was weird. How'd you get into the crypto space? I don't know, I just wanted to trade a bunch of like Super Mario Brothers points for Sonic rings, just like all my friends are doing, and making all this fucking money. Find beach houses in La Jolla. I don't know how the hell they did it. Um, no, I'm actually, so uh, for a living, I'm a real estate agent. And, I, you know, I'm self driven, but I'm not. And being a real estate agent, you have to be self driven like all the time. Um, other things you don't really have to be. Like, I don't mind a little bit of hustle, but like, so I sit down on my phone and like, I'm looking for clients and all this stuff, and I get a video notification from YouTube saying there's 10 problems with Batman nobody wants to talk about. And I'm like, what the fuck did I miss about Batman? It takes 35 years. I got 14 minutes. And then like the videos just keep going from there and there and there. And I just lose it. So I'm a lazy person. So I started getting into comedy. I figured I could try to get paid for this. And I did kind of get, like the first time I got indirectly paid, I was kind of excited, so, um, I was in, like, all right. I don't like always, like when I first started, I didn't want to tell a bunch of people I was doing comedy because they're like, oh my god, tell me a joke or whatever. Or, oh shit, this guy's a comedian. So I went to a strip club with a friend of mine because it's a bear market. What the fuck else are you going to do? He goes, uh, he goes, oh, this is my friend Mike. I don't know why he was trying to impress her. I mean, I guess I could maybe guess, but he was like, he's a comedian. And she just like runs up to me. And it was really cool because this doesn't happen. Me, but she like came up to me and held us first and she was like, tell me a joke. And I was like, well, oh, God, comedy club doesn't work like that. I was like, what if I found out at the bank you were a stripper? And I was like, give me a lap dance. It doesn't work like that. She was like, all right, that's kind of funny. I said, let's let's do this. What if I told you a joke and I kind of made you laugh? Gotta get it for lap dance. She said, what's your work? 
So it's always just my favorite joke, not even one I made up. Uh, anybody know why New Yorkers are so depressed? There's a light at the end that sounds like New Jersey. <laughs> she loved it, um, and I got a free lap dance. I paid for the next six, but the first one, I got a free lap dance. That was a good time. Um, I kind of, so I tried trading, like, cryptocurrencies. Um, I believe, like, I, I'm in a cryptocurrency because I believe in it, and I believe in, like, what it can do. Uh, I'm more like a holder now. I'm just hanging on to nothing. I don't want to trade nothing with nobody. I'm just stingy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to tell people like I heard people crypto too. I don't know how that's going to work, but we'll figure it out. So Did there's photos of it too. There you go. Um, I do think that like long term, I don't know, maybe I'm like a closet geeks maximalist. I do think that Bitcoin is going to destroy the dollar. Because uh, I've already destroyed thousands of dollars. <laughs> I know I can do it. We can all do this together. <laughs> One of the reasons we're doing this whole series is because we want to kind of create a space, uh, and integrity is a good name. You know, we started with crypto shit show because the idea was just like, if you start at the basement, nobody's gonna like you can't. It can't get any worse. Like it's free of it. There's Popeyes chicken coming. It's not like we got it catered from like I don't know somewhere expensive. By the way, thanks to you for Um But I do. I think we need a, like a space now where there's like bulldogs and our watchdogs that really care about each other. Um, and that, in a way, like intimidate people. And I don't think we really have that anymore. Like it's, I, you know, I think about names of like people that when we were younger growing up, like I'm 40, all right? So, and I love rap, I love hip hop. You guys like the Wu-Tang Clan? Yeah. All right, so they're like, you know, I, if I was in like, a, like an upcoming rapper, I'd be scared to death to go up to somebody like Ghostface Killer and trying to like sell my demo tape, because that's like a scary name. What's the scariest name is right now in 2018? Fluffy Boy. So listen, um, I want you guys to enjoy yourselves, have a great time. Um, with that being said, that's my introduction to this gentleman over right here, Fluffy Cone. By the way, real quick, uh, before you clap, uh, I just binge watched The Magical Crypto Friends. So in my sleep, I'm like, best thing to do is to clean up. Thanks. I really appreciate you. There you go. So that's always fantastic. And uh, hopefully that, that leads to better technology for Bitcoin. 
Um, I think part of this comes down to uh, to the larger question of um, will I be sad if Monero goes away? <laughs> and, and obviously I will. Um, but the reality is if Monero dies, for whatever reason, whether it is because we made bad decisions technologically or just because people are, are tired of hearing the name Monero or they think orange is a bad color for a logo. Mm -hmm. uh, if, 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 it, if it goes away, I'll be sad. There'll be some people who will be sad. But the reality is the market will continue. Everything will continue. And I think that what a lot of, um, of, of old coin people forget is that if anything goes away, if Ethereum goes away, yeah, there'll be some sad people. But <coughs> everything will continue unabated. If Bitcoin goes away, we are screwed. Bitcoin is our one shot at getting this right. And all this other stuff, like it can either help or hinder Bitcoin's march and march to progress. But um, hopefully it helps instead of hindering it. And I think that that's, that's something, that's a reality that a lot of people try and avoid talking about because, you know, they, they sort of go like, well, you know, I think that scam coin number seven is going to be the one that's okay. going to be bigger than Bitcoin. But, you know, like, it's kind of point number seven, who cares if it goes away? Obviously, it's not going to be a worse right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. just making sure. Yeah. So I, well, I mean, I, I, just, I just want to put my vote out there for me being an EOS block producer. I think that I'd make a great candidate. <laughs> <laughs> I can get on those phone calls, those Monday phone calls. <laughs> we decide the transactions for me. <laughs> you know, like, I'll make myself available. No problem. And then I'll click those buttons to make sure that those transactions go through. I can do that. Fucking <laughs> like pretty, you ask what producer. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, one thing you, you brought up that was interesting is, is you, it seems like you're kind of alluding to uh, confidential transactions and, and utilizing something like bulletproofs. We might be a couple years out uh, from even being close to uh, with usage of the Bitcoin. Uh, so, so you're pretty sure that this is probably something down the road. This isn't going to happen within a year. This might be two years, three years. I mean, if you think about how long it just took to implement Segwit, I mean, I don't know, but the confidential transactions seems like a much bigger kind of change or, or implementation add. So. Yeah, so, so maybe the larger question there is, um, is, is privacy on Bitcoin even achievable? And, and it's an interesting question because I, so I, I was just in Panama now for a few days, and a lot of, of the time that I spent in Panama was being with regulators. And uh, I met with like the head of the Banking Council, the head of the Banking Alliance, which are two different people entirely, which is very confusing to me. Um, and we spoke about <coughs> crypto, we spoke about Monero, we spoke about Bitcoin. And one of the things that they raised, which was fascinating, is they kept bringing up the fact that Bitcoin is traceable. In their mind, when you use Bitcoin, it like slaps your name on it and it goes, you know, and it's like, oh, Bob did this transaction and sent money to North Korea. And I, and I try to explain to them that that's not <coughs> the reality. Um, and, and they sort of, you know, didn't, they kind of got it, but they didn't really. Um, and I think, I think Bitcoin served as a really interesting Trojan horse from, from that perspective. Because Bitcoin's gotten into places where it might not otherwise have been able to, purely on the basis of regulators assuming that it's been massively traceable. Um, and, and I think that that's going to make adding privacy to Bitcoin really contentious. Um, not well, you know, I, 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 don't, I think that we've got, this, we've got this interesting thing that's happened now in that we can add features to Bitcoin to a software um, using the same technology that was used in Segwit. Um, but it, it, so it doesn't necessarily need to be contentious um, to that point, but you know, people can still continue using the old stuff. And yet they will probably end up talking it just because you know they, they can't afford it Bitcoin non private. Bitcoin is basically. Bitcoin government approved. But but I think it's it's concerning to me because that should not even be an issue. Privacy should be a basic human right. And 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 it should be something that politicians should want to preserve, if not for the sake of their constituents, for their own sake, because they are doing some dodgy stuff. And they should really want um, a trace of transactions. Um, and, and I think that they that, that hopefully we can bring them around to that and ultimately it'll be, you know, like like it'll be capitulated by. Because Bitcoin doesn't care. 
And if Bitcoin adds privacy and it gets delisted from every exchange, it's not going to care. It's not going to stop the march of Bitcoin. So I kind of think that, that I mean, my, my push would always be to add privacy to Bitcoin at that point. Um, I think regulators will not like it, but let's see what happens. Cool. Next question. Susan. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of new people came into crypto towards the end of the year when Bitcoin when all the crypto was going up and um, they're really confused about the bear market right now. Um, people don't know if it's whales, market manipulation, if it's companies with uh, ecosystems before they announce they're taking on coin, it goes up. So what are your thoughts on the bear market overall? Uh, so I've been in I've been in Bitcoin with since early twenty eleven, so this is what my like fifth bear market or whatever. <laughs> You know, there's a point at which, um, at which you, you don't even, you, you almost don't even notice it um, because it's just like, oh, okay, it's that one, who cares? Um, and and it, I think that to try and convey that to noobs is really difficult. I mean, can you imagine if you bought Bitcoin at 20000 and and, you know, you've now put in, $20,000 is a lot of money and maybe you've gone and like cashed in your 401k or... So, you know, mortgage your house or whatever, and now you're down. I mean, you're down to like a quarter of the value almost, um, and, and it might slip below that. And, you know, it's, I, I always think back to late 2013, because before 2013, I didn't really have a lot of friends who were non-crypto people who got in. And late 2013, when it did that, like, I mean, the, the price literally, doubled up twice in a 30 day period. And I had friends who were like, oh, this is Bitcoin, how do I get the Bitcoin? Uh, like, where do I buy it? So I knew the price is going up. And I was like, well, maybe it's not a good time to buy, but you know, I'm not gonna like force you and tell you what to do. And some of my friends bought, and I, you know, I mean, I'll explain how they should buy, but I'm not gonna tell them what they should buy or how much or anything. Um, and some of them bought in, you know, January it crashed, and February it crashed some more, and went down from $1,300 or $1,200 down to like $400. Um, and I saw people really struggle. People that I knew who were like, like they were teary-eyed and deeply concerned. <coughs> and there are two people in particular, one of which came to me and said, look, I put money in, but I, I listened to your advice about, you know, it's a long-term game, I mustn't look at the price for the next five years. And so, you know, but I'm, I've seen the price and I'm worried. And I was like, just trust me, stop looking at the price, come back in five years' time. And he was like, okay, fine. And the other guy was like, you know, I'm actually, like, I gave him the same advice. And he was like, no, I'm going to cut my losses. And I was like, just hold on. And so he held on for a couple of months and then he was like, no, I'm cutting my losses. Um, and Obviously, like the guy that cut his losses ended up, you know, with like half the value. And the guy that held on, well, I mean, he's really happy right now. <laughs> he's super happy. He doesn't, he doesn't care that it's crashed. You know, he was like extra super happy at 20,000, but he's still super happy at like four or five or six because he's way up. And I think on, if you can help people to understand that this only works on a macro time scale, that's really useful. Um, and, and the example that I've tried to use with people is I've tried to get them to, to look at like Apple stock. You know, it, like Apple stock, really, if you want to make big money with Apple, you had to buy Apple stock in like the 90s. You know, before half of the people in crypto were born. And, <laughs> and I mean like, you look at it and it's like, that's a macro time scale. That's an investment horizon. Even if you're taking like super big risks and you're investing, you're a VC, you're investing like C capital, the, the average exit period on C capital investments is nine years. You're not even able to exit. It's not a security token that you can go and sell. You've got to find someone else to buy your shares. It's nine years. And there are people who bought a 20,000 who are freaking out like what, six months later? It's like, dude, come on. You know, chill. Come back to me in five years. If it's still down in five years, then you can be upset. But I mean, six months is not a time scale. You know, six months is like, eh, whatever. 
And I think people people need to understand that. The other thing that they need to understand is volatility <coughs> is volatility sucks, but it's also really good if what you want is to make money. Um, and volatility happens across the board. So Facebook crashed twenty percent out of it. Uh, you know, Facebook stock is like that's like a, a, a stock where people are like their grandparents are investing in Facebook stock, and it like crashes twenty percent. That's not ideal. So so volatility happens across the board. Regardless of, of how blue chip the thing is, or how fantastically stable it might be, gold has crashed phenomenally. Um, it's gone up and down in the past, and and Bitcoin's going to do the same thing. And it doesn't care if people like sell out and sell early, but a loss is only recognized when you sell. If you don't sell, then you know just hold on until you make a profit. Next question, Mr. Harbour. <laughs> <clears throat> so just real quick to get back to the privacy, um, there is some work being done with um, Xiaomi and Coin Joins uh, with the hidden wallet, and I was wondering if you were, I'm sure you're following that, so I was wondering if you could just comment a little bit on some of that, um, especially with the recent live transaction that was actually made, the first Xiaomi on mainnet transaction on Bitcoin. Sure, so I like the work that's, that's being done on, um, particularly the, the stuff that's being done by Samurai Wallet. Um, like, like more so than anything, because I feel like Samurai Wallet has picked away at it um, over a period of time. But in Wallet, of course, is, is a fantastic, brand new, yeah, and and and, uh, and it's a fantastic sort of uh, way of dealing with things. Um, the, the reality is, and I've said this before, that privacy only matters if it's default and and if it's almost forced for everyone. And the reason for that is. If you have like the most phenomenal privacy technology in the world, but only a hundred people are using it, then your maximal uh, anonymity set is hundred people. So you need a lot of people to use it. And and with the with big data analysis and with the the cleverness of companies like Chain Analysis, we really can't afford to screw around with this. Um, something like Hidden Wallet is amazing, but it's only amazing if you have a lot of people using it. Um, and unfortunately, I think that we're not, we're just not going to get that with, um, yes, this cool toy that three people in the world use. Um, so, so for me, it's, it's good from a technological advancement, but I'm interested in seeing how we can make that like the only way to transact. You know, I, I want to see like all of these like really weird, you know, we, we talk about stuff like brain wallets and whatever, this is like the de facto wallet. That, that people use now, um, you know, and uh, and of course you've got blockchain, uh, got info, and Coinbase. Of course, people use that as a wallet. Um, and until like those big players start using it, it's not really worth talking about. You know, I mean, it's great, it's great for us who are interested in the technology, but it's not great from an anonymity set perspective. You just want that crowd that you can get lost in. Um, so I think like like sure, let's push that technology forward. But let's keep the conversation going about like making it the default way of transacting. And and given how hard it has been to get companies to just adopt safe words, especially the big guys, I think getting them to adopt privacy technology is going to be a, a, a bigger challenge. But it's a challenge that we should be up for. Sounds good. Thank you. Cool. Uh, so Next question. Sounds good. All right, so uh, my question is the, um, the hurdles of privacy coins that are mandatory and default privacy coins like Monero could have an institutional environment where we would be able to see a Monero ETF. Would it ever be a part of the crypto S&P 500? Would we be able to see privacy coins get the same love what Bitcoin's getting when it's considered a privacy coin by the mainstream media who doesn't even get that it is not a privacy coin? If it were more so Monero, like, would we be seeing Bitcoin ETFs being even suggested? Would we be seeing these uh, physical trades on the CME floors? What would the problems be if Bitcoin was truly private? Because it is something that has to come. I don't think it's something that could be now. Yeah, look, I, I think, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think Bitcoin's going to be a bit of a Trojan horse there, but I think there's going to be a big pushback from regulators. Um, just, just based on the discussions I've had, all over the world with regulators, they are not big fans of, um, of, of 
privacy when you actually explain it to them. I mean, a conversation that I've had over and over again is how amazing is tamper resistant, censorship resistant money? You can send it anyway, even North Korea. And they go, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> you can't send money to North Korea. And, and my, you know, to which I always say, like, so what stops me from taking, like, like cash and putting it in my bag and flying to North Korea and just dropping it off there. And then they're like, because uh, cash is regulated. I'm like, yes, but where is it regulated? It's regulated on the way in and on the way out. It's regulated, I mean, if you go to your bank and you say, I want to withdraw $100,000, they're going to file a report to say, like, Carlo withdrew $100,000, that's super dodgy. He's obviously flying to North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> or he's going to a very expensive strip club. And, and I mean, like, I look at that and I'm like, okay, you know, the, the, it's not that we can't do this stuff with cash, it's just that, that they put the, the regulation, I think, in the right place. They put it in the on ramps and the off ramps. And this doesn't stop people from getting cash through alternate means. You know, like they can start a business and get paid in cash and just keep a portion of it you know, under the table. There's all sorts of things that you can do if you want to be dodgy. And dodgy people are going to be dodgy. They're going to do dodgy things. It doesn't matter how well regulated your, your cable thing is. Um, and, uh, and I think that it is, that that's, these are the challenges that we face from a privacy perspective, is regulators just don't understand that. Even after I've explained it, they're just sort of like, uh-huh. And then they go back and they're like, he said that as in my <laughs> Did you hear that? And it's, that's all they remember, you know, is like Monero is used for sitting like 12 grid. Um, but the, the reality is that it can be, and there's nothing that we can do to stop that. But that's not why privacy is interesting. Um, and, and I don't think regulators get that yet. But I'm hopeful that they will. I'm hopeful that over time we will educate them. Um, and and the, the, the best way to do that is just to get them to like publish their bank statements. You know, like, to get them to understand the need for privacy for every person, not just for like you know certain situations. So I've used that example, like you know, why don't you give us your bank statements? Like why don't you publish them? You know, if you think privacy is so bad. And the other example I've used, um, which really only works for American regulators, is I start I start talking about how um, the CIA needs to move money to the operators overseas, and I'm like. So, you know, what, how are you guys moving money to your operator? You've got operators in North Korea. How are you moving money to them? Could be Monero. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, and it's, I think that the regulators will start to understand that there is a, there's a usefulness and a utility to, to privacy points. But in between then and now, one of the biggest risks we face um, as a privacy-focused project is just a general apathy towards privacy. Just people going like, that, that whole like, well, if I've got nothing to hide, why do I need privacy? Um, and it's, it's, you know, institutions and individuals alike. And I don't think that there's a quick fix for that. I don't think there's a way for, for people to really understand the need for privacy, except for like, them having their, their pants pulled down. Um, you know, and it's happened, it's happened with like the, the Facebook thing. Ashley Madison. Yeah, Ashley, the Ashley Madison hack. And this, this constant ongoing stream of hacks that reveals metadata, not just to like, you know, um, bad people, but it reveals metadata to like ordinary citizens. Your boss can find tons of information about you, even Googles for you. You know, like, like frighteningly private information. And I think people are, are they're, they're going to at some point start understanding that, that. That privacy needs to just be baked into our everyday lives. And it's not to say that, that privacy somehow defeats the ability to govern or the ability to police. Because really, we've only had traceable currency for like the past 30 years. Before that, if you looked at the way the banking environment worked, banks operated on a branch level. And they, they, they would then like receive a check and they would phone the originating branch and they'd say, we received this check, does Bob have $100 in his account? Yes, he does. Great, now we can cash that check or deposit it or whatever. And if you were a government agent, agency and you wanted to find information on someone, you literally had to phone every branch and be like, do you have an account under the name Bob? No, we don't. Okay, great. And, and that was an incredibly laborious process. 
And then we started to have centralization of that data and, and uh, computing infrastructure came into place. And government agents were able to subpoena a central, a central banking authority and just get like every bank account that I had. But that's really only been the past 30 years. So how did they police before then? How did they manage to solve crimes without having traceable money before then? Well, they were able to use good old-fashioned police work. They were able to use lifestyle audits for stuff like tax obligations. So the, the, the technology exists to stop criminals without having traceable money. It's just that not only have, um, have the law enforcement agencies become lazy and become too used to having access to all this metadata and information, but financial institutions have become agents for governments. Mm. They are the ones now who are doing the police work. Yeah. They're the ones going, oh, yeah, there's a suspicious deposit. I better report it. It's like, no, Mr. Policeman, it's your job to figure out that there's something suspicious happening. It's not the bank's job. Do your job. You are the law enforcement officer. And I think that that's what we're going to see more and more is, you know, technology being used as a way to skirt authority. And they're going to have to realize that they have to go back to basics. They have to go back to being suspicious first and then getting a warrant and then going and surveilling someone. Passive surveillance is not a technology that should be in the hands of anyone, much less a government, that can't figure out whether marijuana is legal or not. <laughs> So, yeah, that's going to be that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's exactly that. I mean, I think you're going to find about holding on there. Or, like, institution, I mean, once it starts rolling in, that they better hold a big bag in the narrow in the event that there's a hack that goes wrong, uh, they can pay those hackers off the narrow. Yes, because they're not going to be paid. Yeah, but they better, but they're afraid to because of potential regulations in the future don't even exist yet tying their hands behind your back from something that may save their ass. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's the, I mean, that's the frightening thing, but there's no, there's no real way around that except just continued education and, and hoping that, like, people wake up to it. Um, I mean, at the, at the very least, like, let them hold some Bitcoin and let them, let them start to understand how, you know, we talk about Bitcoin being traceable, but really, it's not that easy for the lay person to trace. You know, it's not like you can go and Google a Bitcoin address and get all the information on it. Unless the person is dumb enough to like person on the coin. But technology companies are chasing that, right? Yeah, chain so analysis and, and yeah. other companies are chasing that. They're trying to, but, but they're not publishing that information. You've got to pay them for that information. And I think that that's something of a saving grace. Um, but that, yeah, that information is there. It's just not publicly accessible, which is great. Well, yeah. But it's not really accessible because that's yeah. the point. Yeah, and I think that there's, um, to, to some degree, you know, we, like there the are technologies that are trying to make it harder, um, like hidden wallets, you know, just, just make it a little bit harder for them. And that's what we can do. We can just keep making it harder. Hey, move, you know, move in and out of Monero. Do anything. Just to make it a little bit harder for them. Just to frustrate them. Or well, just to keep the cat and the mouse working. Yeah. So, we can, so that they can't get too far ahead. Yeah. Of the privacy. Absolutely, and we just keep we just keep playing the game, and, and at some point they're going to realize that their only choice is to give up and to accept that the technology exists and it's unstoppable. Um, I, I think that we're perhaps in, we're, we're getting to a point where they might um, do something really stupid, like try and ban uh, Monero. But um, no way. If if they do, they yeah, it, it's yeah, it's a slippery slope. If they did that, completely. they'd have to ban other coins. Yeah. I, I think the, the, um, the, the most interesting thing for me is the fact that Zcash has got a um, governable presence in the States. And so I think of Zcash as a warrant canary. <laughs> if anything's going to go down, they're going to go after them first. So I'm just like, cool, as long as they still, they still exist with like a Delaware LLC or whatever it is. And, and I think Zico even said that he wanted to reduce the anonymity, but there's nobody even using the anonymity for yeah. use of the coin records. Yeah. Absolutely. Mike. Uh, Sorry. You're good next time. Go for it. Who are you asking? I was just, do you think that, I was saying, I'm breaking up your screen on the website or something, and do you think that, like, the lightning that would add some sort of, like, the CX that would be like that? That's a good question. I think, um, I think that privacy of Bitcoin 
ideally should be on the first hand, um, at least to some degree. And I'll tell you why. Um, Lightning, to, to answer your second question, Lightning adds um, a significant amount of privacy by default, but especially when you combine a, an atomic lightning path with Tumblebit on, on either end, then you have this amazing, incredible thing where nobody can ascertain um, which of the lightning nodes that's connected to this Tumblebit node, pay which of the lightning nodes is connected to that Tumblebit node. Just that a node paid that node, and that's all we know. Um, and this is the passive observer who we assume has got like lots of access to to all the net to the network. Um, the problem is when the the channels close, then an observer can observe the change in balances, and then they can go um, they can sort of assert that Bob paid Mary because Bob's balance went down and Mary's balance went up. Um, what happened in between they don't know, but they just know that Bob definitely paid Mary. Now. With um, uh, confidential transactions on layer one, that can't happen because you, when the channel's closed, you can't see the, the new amounts. And so I think that there's a combination of some privacy on layer one that is required to defeat um, uh, layer two privacy attacks. Um, but definitely, uh, you know, privacy doesn't have to be maximal privacy like it is, or like Monero tries to do. It can be even if it's just confidential transactions. That already would be an incredibly powerful privacy tool when combined with like lightning and Um So that would be like, in in my mind, it would be an ideal position to be in because it would give um, Bitcoin really, really strong privacy. Uh, but it would do so in a way where governments can still go like, oh, look, Bitcoin is traceable. <laughs> when you are back at the ranch. <laughs> So yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the, the my hope for the future from that perspective. My good question. Um, so I, I might have this wrong. The, the Monero project. Um, it's, it's it's my assumption that y'all are changing the. I say y'all because you're you're. Y'all. <laughs> y'all are changing. All y'all. Yeah. All y'all. Uh, y'all are changing the uh, mining algorithm every six months. And and I That's believe what, yeah. and I believe that uh, it is being done to uh, to do like be AC resistant um, or to just screw over with me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so <laughs> my, my question is, why would Monero do that, and why wouldn't Bitcoin do it? And is it a good idea for Bitcoin to also do it, or is this just something for Monero? Maybe you can tell me. Sure. Um, AC resistance, I think, is a ship that has largely sailed for Bitcoin. Um, I think it's a little bit too late to, to, to even go down that road. Um, with Monero, you know, it's the, the aim is not to be, at least this is from my perspective, I obviously can't speak for everyone. You can talk but, like you support it maybe. Yeah. yeah, so from my perspective, and I've said this before, um, I think that it is incredibly important for Monero to maintain some degree of ASIC resistance for as long as it can. And hopefully it, it can do that until we have like, SHA-3 ASICs that are like highly commoditized. And then there's an algorithm that we can switch to. Um, but between now and then, I think that it is, it's dangerous, um, at least from my perspective, for Monero to capitulate and let Bitcoin just dominate that space. And, and, and you, you mentioned SHA-3, would you see uh, Monero going to SHA-3 eventually? And that's yeah. Cool. And yeah, absolutely. I, I, that, would, that would be my hope, is I think SHA-3 is a reasonable algorithm. Um, and I would imagine a, a scenario, in, in that scenario, that Bitcoin continues with SHA-2 because there's so much SHA-2 mining power behind it. And SHA-3 ASICs are a natural progression from that. They become reasonably commoditized, there may be a couple of small coins that are, are using it, and then Monero is able to, to switch to that. And when I say commoditized, I mean, you know, if you think of like USB flash drives, those are commoditized. If you go to a conference, they throw like a 16 gigabyte USB flash drive in your bag, in your swag bag because it's like, yeah, a dead card. Only no viruses in that. And no malware, this is the malware free one, we promise. Um, and uh, what they do, they throw, it in, they throw it in swag bags and they give it away and it's like, like, a, like a ch one of the cheaper corporate gifts. Um, and that's commoditization of technology. So it's not to say that, that we need to get that to that point, but it would be nice if Shark V Aces would be thrown in swag bags at conferences. Uh, just a, one follow up question. What would that look? Um, and I don't know if you've already done a, an algorithm 
the switch. I haven't been following it close enough. We've done one, and there's another one coming up. Okay, so, so I haven't really noticed, maybe I'm not doing it right, but I haven't noticed like upgrading my Monero node, and it seems to be syncing still. Does that just mean not doing it right? Or, like, for instance, it's, it would seem like to me you'd have to upgrade your software every time. You, you, you would have to uh, just sync the blockchain. Yeah, when, when was the last <coughs> time you upgraded your, your node? Oh, over six months, like maybe a year ago. Um, yeah, then you're probably on. on I'm on a four. I'm probably on a four. Yeah, you're on the arrow. You're on the um, No, I'm serious. Like, yeah, you're, yeah. Probably, you're probably guaranteed. <coughs> like, if you have a if you have an algorithm switch every six months, you yeah. almost have a guaranteed like group of people like me who don't upgrade. Yes. We're, we're continuing. Absolutely. The, the the true vision of yeah. the arrow. That you, you're you're <laughs> trend, continuing. Thank you for today's true vision. <laughs> the original white paper said that this is the algorithm. Yeah, so, um, so the. the you know, this is obviously a challenge, and we have a, a there's a notification system that, well, firstly, every six months it just says, hey, it's time to upgrade your node, even even if it isn't time to upgrade your upgrade your node. So that happens. So your node should be blaring like red messages. I'm true with the vision, apparently. So yeah, I'm, apparently. I can probably the code via the white paper. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, it gives you a compiling from master instead of downloading binaries, then you might actually. Fortunate enough to be your like a relatively current four minutes, um, but yeah, like it's, it's we, we have a we have a six month like noisy notification that goes in. Um, also, every time there's a new a new version, even if it's just a point release, then the node does complain. Nodes do complain and say it's time to upgrade. Um, and that's kind of all we can do with that. There's not really a, a way to, to do it sort of much better. Um, we've gotten we've gotten into the habit, or, or the Monero community as a whole has gotten into the habit of upgrading their node every six months. Um, the exchanges and services that use Monero have gotten into the habit of upgrading their node. But there are always people that, that are on the fringe that don't. That said, the people that are on the fringe normally are using light wallets, so to them it doesn't really matter. They're not reliant on their own node syncing. Would you say during those six month periods where you're switching that algorithm, Monero is temporarily insecure, and that if you're gonna accept a large transaction, maybe wait after like a you know, 10, 20 blocks, whatever it might be, because there's like this kind of weird point every six months, or is that not? You mean like happens? around the four times? Uh, say so. So you mean you, you not not during the six months, but like at, at, this, at that at point? At time yes. of upgrade, yeah. it, it's kind of like there's this weird yeah. period. If you're going to accept large Monero yeah. transactions, maybe wait a day or maybe wait a couple hours. <coughs> yeah. So so, so you have a flag height um, where the four happens. Um, in other words, there's a there's a particular point in time. There's a particular four height. Okay, so um, they don't wait at a time. Yeah, and, and, it's a and that's it. And you just, like we release, we normally try to release binaries, um, or at least release compatible binaries like like two, three months before. Okay. Um, and uh, and then there's sufficient time. People upgrade as a natural course of things. They know it's complaining. Um, they've now installed the upgrade, and then when that flag height occurs, then they know it just carries on running and doesn't keep back. Okay. Any other questions? I have plenty of things. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more thing, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, just, so, <clears throat> regarding the, the, the algorithms changing, do, do you think that it really actually does do a whole lot of damage? Uh, damage do, you, do you not think that they can just quickly spin up and uh, at least have the ability at this point, with all the money that they've had and all the practice that they've had all these additional points of course, do you think that it's not possible they can just spin up um, a basically secret like literally maybe a less than a week after you change the algorithm? Or so, prepare ahead of time, because you know, or yeah, three months ahead of time, yeah. okay. so, okay. so, so that algorithm change, right. yeah, that algorithm change will, so we had this discussion, like, um, that the actual algorithm change, when does it get finalized? And currently our aim is three months before. So they have a three month period, and the, the, the design of the ASIC is of course the one challenge, and let's assume that they have a, a, an incredibly fast team who can, they, they've programmed the FPGA, they've now, you know, uh, they've, they've sort of like sketched out the ASIC and it's, they've done that for like. Then they still need to go and take out. And that take out process is the real trick. Um, they are not going to be able to take out, um, like, at all with three months. Not even like a small prototype run. Like, it, it, it would just be way too expensive. You know, now they're going to blow a couple of million dollars and the tape out takes five months. So the tape out is where they actually go and produce the ASICs. 
So they'll go, you know, there's a factory that manufactures the silicon wafers and it does all of that. Um, and the, you know, the tape out is like literally a production run of several hundred thousand or several thousand or whatever um, silicon chips. And you're saying it still takes months. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, for for that, for the, the factory to gear up, get ready, you know, I mean, they've got other orders in place. Even even if like Bitmain were really, really like, you know, complete hard asses and they wanted to get it going um, and they pushed really hard, um, then they could sort of, you know, maybe bring it down to like a shorter period of time. Um, but the reality is that we're, you know, we're to, yeah, three months should be out there. Um, and, uh, and we're, you know, the, again, the, the whole trick is like, if we, if we start to perceive that, like, whatever secret ASIC mining is happening, if we see an increase in hash rate without a decrease in GPU hash rate elsewhere, if we sort of, you know, get ahead of that this is happening, yeah. then there, there's actions that we can take. We can merge the, the um, or we can finalize that pull request closer to the time, closer to the forecast. Um, but I mean, I think that Bitmain, largely after having been screwed in this last one, I think they they've realized it's going to be a waste of data. How are you sure that they got screwed? I, I don't know if they did this or So so what happened was at that fork height, the Monero hash rate plummeted um, massively down, like to to lose like a down to like half or a quarter of, of what it had been at, um, and then it recovered um, back up to about half of, uh, of what it had been at. Obviously, it was incredibly profitable for GPUs to mine in that first uh, in the first sort of few weeks. So we had a ton of GPUs coming on board. Um, hash rate went up to about three quarters of what it had been at, and then settled back down to about half. Um, in the meantime, that that sort of two thirds or whatever that had disappeared, uh, which were the Bitmain ASICs, continued to mine. I don't know what the fork was called, Monero Classic or whatever. Uh, <laughs> it was like four. Of them. Yeah, there was like four of them, but there's only one. I think Monero Original was the one that Bitmain chose to mine. Um, and so, despite them not having sold a single unit, or not having, no, they'd sold a bunch, but they hadn't shipped any. They hadn't shipped a single unit, but like, whatever, 600 mega hashes of, of Monero's hash rate is suddenly mining this like, scammy fork that like, no one even cares about, that has no dev support. So, so in other words, if you're a Monero farmer, there's seasons to mine your crops. You're your Monero, there's a season, and it's around the fork period where your where your farms are profitable for you to harvest and grow. Just the season two you mine. Yeah. So, so so there's there's every six months there's another harvest. Yes. Per se, of yeah. GPUs that are profitable temporarily. Yeah. Well, I mean, GP, GPUs um, like to get on your electricity price, price might be profitable right now. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a farmer. Maybe I'm getting CPU. Yeah, CPUs are largely like not profitable uh, unless you don't make the electricity, then they're always profitable. Um, but yeah, of course they're more profitable around that full time, absolutely. Next question. Uh, yeah. Is Monero a sound financial investment? <laughs> Definitely not. It's yeah. <laughs> a great way to lose money. It's <laughs> <laughs> a fun way to lose money. <laughs> Definitely. You know, we put the fun in fungibility. <laughs> <laughs> well, Coinbase uh, recently said they're going to be adding a bunch of shit coins to Coinbase, and then Coinbase Pro got even a bigger list. Yeah. What was one of the shit coins you were like, oh man, I wish they would have added that? Like, what's a project you were expecting to see or would like to see on Coinbase and, this, and the fact that they enlisted the Peter and Classic and did nothing? What does the weight of Coinbase have or have not a coin even matter? Well, I mean, I, I was really, I was really happy to see that they had um, tat tattoo on that list. You know, I mean, that was really, what? yeah, it's a coin called tat tattoo. <coughs> yeah, it's from tat tattoo wing, right? Yes, that's what I imagined. <laughs> I've never heard of this project, but it got on the Coinbase list, which was. Largely equal parts hilarious and sad. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, I mean, the, the, this is pretty comprehensive. They had like all the major scamming there, so yeah. you know, I mean, the, the only thing that they were really missing, I think, was just connecting one point. So, <laughs> what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? <laughs> I got to be fish. Uh, when, um, so, a lot of people in the Monero community are waiting for a hardware support or hardware wallet support, and I think Ledger is the first one. 
that is going to do that. What is the uh, status with that, you think? And when, when, do you, when do you proceed, we can where do we start seeing the narrow on the budget? You can do it right now. The, um, with the 12.3 um, release, even the GUI supports it. Um, so we can, can get a ledger right now, yeah. and then uh, pick a ledger which we have the latest version, and yeah. you can actually store them around on the ledger yeah. right now. You can't, um, you can't use the Ledger app to, to do it, you have to use the Monero software. Oh. Um, but other than that... Do you have any idea when, when, when it can be done with just literally a Ledger? Or a hardware or a post? Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, you use the, the Ledger but with the Monero oh, wallet okay. software. Okay, okay. So That's yeah. what I mean. So, so you can't use the, Neo. They've got that Chrome app and whatever, you can't use that okay. to, to translate. But you can, because, you, you, you know... But they just use the API. Yeah. Okay. So, so it still like operates through, you know, talks directly to the ledger, ledger device, and the code was written by the ledger guys. So yeah, I was going to ask you who developed. It. So have you written any good things or bad things? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a little bit chunky. I think people are, are still getting used to it. It would be nice to have like to simplify that and, and have it less chunky. Um, but I think it's uh, it's getting there, um, and uh, people are, are getting used to it. Um, Trezor also said with the Model T, it's going to support Monero. Um, the, new, the Model T is out yet, or is it not? Yeah, it's out. Yeah. 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 Um, and they're going to support Monero in the future. That's what I understood. And I think it will probably work, um, I would imagine it will work similarly. Uh, there are also Monero um, uh, mobile wallets that are busy with the support for Ledger. So Monorujo is an Android wallet that is busy building support for, um, for Ledger. And uh, my Monero is also work, working on that as well, because my Monero is a desktop app. Um, it's a lightweight wallet, so I think that'll be quite useful. And it looks like my crypto, you know, the the, uh, my, uh, the Ethereum, Ethereum yeah. fork, uh, Ethereum lightweight wallet fork. They're working on adding Monero support, and they also have Ledger support working already. Uh, no, I predict that in this space at the end of this year, be, Monero will be able to be completely embedded space. That's kind of yeah. what we're seeing, right? It's yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much like, you know, Ledger's pretty much there. There's just some refinements that I think are necessary from a UX perspective. Trezor is getting pretty close. And then, of course, you've got the unhackable bit by wallet. That's what I recommend. That's, that's what I recommend. We'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that. What are my thoughts on that? It's the most secure wallet. It's, it's obviously the, it's, it's unhackable. It's unhackable. So everyone should have one. <laughs> just don't let anyone see you type into your seat. I mean, <laughs> no, just I, don't tell anybody you have one. Yeah, I think I think that they I think that they were. I mean, I don't know them. I don't know if they're stupid people or, or you know um, clever people who are just naive. I think that, that anyone who makes a claim like like my wallet isn't hackable is just asking for trouble. Um, especially if you do so this close to dead time. Uh, <laughs> where a bunch of people are going to sit in a room with your wallet. $20 million damage. Well, it yeah. was rooted though, right? The yeah, it was rooted. It was rooted very quickly. It was rooted and the keys were extracted from memory. Uh, last I saw, they were still able to extract keys from memory 14 hours after the person that signed the transaction. But it doesn't have memory, so you don't need to worry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, just, I just think it's been a string of, of silly claims. And their reaction, at no point did they just go like, Guys, we screwed up. You know, we made a we made a dumb claim. We, you know, um, and we're we're gonna go and revisit. This. We're gonna go back to square one. They just double down and double down and double down. And now the latest is they're shipping um, like holographic stickers, tamper resistant stickers, to everyone, so that you can put a sticker on your device that you know that no one tampered with it. And it's like it's like please, guys, go to their farm, go to the Tampa village, and then like. And like, see what they do. They will take those tamper stickers off in three seconds and put them back on after they've stuck on with them once. And you will not get a trace of that. I mean, that's literally what the village is for. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's just, I, I think they were, they, they were just silly. And I'm hoping that they, I mean, they probably haven't been for this. You have an unhackable wallet, is that possible? No. Not at all. Not at all. You can have a, you can have a, a reasonable sense of security, um, but look. So the way I the way I view uh, the way I view this in general is, you're not going to be able to avoid um, a persistent hacker, attacker, whatever, um, from targeting who's targeting you from being able to compromise. But what you can do 
is you can prevent, first you can make that persistent hacker is targeting you, you can make their life extremely difficult and, and it's not impossible to get, you, to get to you and to own your stuff, but you can make it like really, really difficult. But what you really want to avoid are the drive-bys. You know, you want to avoid like um, getting your stuff owned when you're live on a podcast, for example, for tax reasons. Um, <laughs> You want to avoid taking your private keys on a boat that might sink. You know what I mean? These are, these are all obvious things that you want to do. But no, you want to, you want to avoid the drive-bys. You want to avoid the, the, passive, the guys who are passively surveilling stuff. Um, so, you know, take obvious security measures. If you're on a Mac, use Little Snitch. Um, if you're on Windows, they're equivalent to Little Snitch. Um, and then monitor your connections. You know, if there's suddenly something that's tried to make connections to your computer, on a local network, that should immediately like raise the red flag. Your spidey senses should go off and you should be like, why is this computer on this network trying to connect to me on port 53? That's unusual. And and you should then like at that point probably just shut your computer down and like go walk away and connect to a different network. <laughs> like just just you know take the precaution. Um, there's VPNs. also things say it. Just VPNs basically. Yeah, VPNs are great. Um, also, firm file integrity monitoring. Um, there are a couple of really good ones. Oh, I forget the name. There's, there's a cross-platform one that's really good, um, and I, I can't remember live here and remember the name. Um, but you know, there are a couple of really good ones, and those are great as well because then when you see like your system files get modified, but you're not not busy installing an update, you know, then you're like, why? Why is that modifying my system? And that should immediately set you off. There's the red flag. And so these are simple things that we can take. These are proportions that we can take beyond the usual, like, you know, don't click on links and emails and that. Just take a couple of precautions and see how it goes. And use two-factor authentication everywhere, but don't use SMS two-factor authentication for the love of God. It does not work. And if, if you use a service that's trying to force you into that, don't use that service. Like Twitter? Like Twitter. No, I mean, like at least with Twitter you can, like, there's a, you can sort of add your phone, get the TOTP stuff, and then remove your phone, and you're left with the TOTP stuff. So, at least it's that. So you have to, you have, you have to add your phone, SMS stuff first, and then you can yeah. understand Google Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, like, what I've done with Twitter um, is I've just got a murder device that, you know, short of somebody already in Twitter, they're not going to know what the number is in the first place. Um, and you can take other proportions of that. You can have better devices registered in the company name. Um, you can have better devices that are registered, that are registered in someone else's name, your buddy's name. You can take some level of precaution where you are forced to, to use SMS um, to FA for something, and like your bank, you know. Um, my bank uses SMS to FA. Our bank, Wells Fargo online, still does not have any type of 2 FA. I don't take Bank of America either. It's great. That's, that's what you. That's, that's how you. <laughs> Just you can make a password. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't matter how clever you think you are. I mean, Reddit got owned by SMS to your page. I mean, that's, and Reddit, I think, is, we can all agree, is a reasonably comprehensive group of individuals. That was millions of accounts. Which yeah. everything, I guess, either major service from Xbox to uh, yeah. Home Depot. Every major service gets owned eventually, so. And I, I tweeted out the other day that um, it, your data, pretty much, no matter what, like, I, at this point, is in somebody's repo. So yeah. you just have to try to secure your stuff as much as possible because your, your data is out there. So just just think like your data is already out there. Yeah. Because more most likely it already is, and it you is. just have to try to constantly maybe change your number or like yeah. take precautions that Ricardo was saying because your data is out there. Yeah, and the aim I think again is just not it's, you're not trying to get like oh the, this is a targeted attack against me because you know if this targeted attack against you then you're probably screwed anyway. Yeah. But like. Just those drive-by attacks, you can avoid getting owned by them because, like, if you get owned by them, that's just embarrassing. How many, how many, how many burner phones do you look through in a, in a couple of week period or whatever? <laughs> um, I, and actually, so I don't change my burner number um, that often. I probably change it every six to eight weeks. Um, you and you have to buy a new burner phone for that? I, well, the, I don't, it's not the phone that's changing, oh, it's the SIM. Yeah. Oh, so you know, the SIM's cheap. Um, and, uh, like no one knows that number, it's just used for like Twitter and stuff, so um, and, it, and even there it's like not used cost devices um, or cost accounts. So like the, it's simple things I mean I, I say it's simple, but it's like relatively simple things like that that you can that you can take. Um, 
precautions you can take and just go from there. Everyone's <laughs> <laughs> got a lot of questions. Well, so, so we talked about Lightning Network earlier. Yes. Um, this is like a, between my friends and I, we, we've been talking about this a lot. What do you think regulators are going to do, if anything, about defining these hub operators as payment you know, processors? And lightning hub? What, do you, what do you think will come out of that, if anything? I don't, I don't Mike, know. Mike, mm -hmm. lightning hub? Or yeah, just, lightning hubs. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if they're going to. Um, AC. From my perspective, Lightning Hub is moving data. Um, it's onion routing, so they literally they get a, a packet of data. They can take the last layer of the onion off, and they get paid in that last layer of the onion. But they don't know what's inside the onion, okay. and so they're just moving data. In fact, um, you could, uh, cons conceptually speaking, you could use the Lightning onion routing network to route just packets of data, and no one would know because they can't see what's inside. So you, you can't, it's not, it's not feasible to say that this is definitely moving financial transactions from one point to another, and if you can't say that, how can you possibly govern it as whatever, if it needs an MSB license? Because they'd have to do that for all the tour notes. Exactly, they'd have to do that for all the tour notes. Not only different they're getting paid, but I mean, that's a game that's you get. You can pay a tour <coughs> out of that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, this is just a quick, like, what do you, it, it, it sounds like you don't think anything's going to happen. For some reason, a lot of people are talking about they do think things are going to happen, which I find interesting. So yeah, this is a bit of an aspect of it. Yeah. It's more than you see. I, I, I surround myself with a variety of people. I, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I was speaking about, like, a variety of people, and, you know, maximalists or, you know, people who are, like, Bitcoin Cash or whatever. Uh, uh, the deep, yeah, you know, we talked about Monero, you talked about uh, Bitcoin and some other projects, and it sounds like to me you believe in an ecosystem in long-term future where multiple blockchains will exist, proof-of-work blockchains, that is, uh, can exist in harmony. Is that, would you say that's a correct statement, or do you think that's long-term not true? I think, um, I think yes, I think that, I, look, I think it's unlikely that we're ever gonna, that we're gonna have everything fail, except Bitcoin, and then no one will ever, possibly, ever again create another token. I don't think that that's feasible. Um, I think that I I like the idea of side chains, but I don't think that we're going to see a sort of mass flocking to side chains. And again, no one ever forks Bitcoin and creates, you know, an, an, um, another crap coin or scam coin. I don't think that's feasible. Um, I think that people are always going to experiment. They're always going to. There's always going to be a slither of the market that is, you know, people creating clones and, and silly projects and tokenizing things that don't need tokens. Um, and that's okay. I think in terms of the, the majority of the market, um, I don't see us having more than a handful of, of uh, base protocols. Um, and, and by a handful, I mean less than five. So, uh, so you mentioned sidechain. So do you have an expert opinion about drive chain or how you look into that? Yeah, so I think drive chain is really interesting, but again, it's, it's, it comes down to people taking the, the easy way out. Does that require a software for the, for the drive chain? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Three. Three? Yeah. Oh, it's not. I did not know that. <laughs> so, that's ridiculous. So, so I have here quoted um, Monero Exit Scam 2020. Uh, but we didn't, I never got No, it was 2023. Oh, 2023. I never got We didn't even get the, you didn't even get the year right. I'm not good at doing that. So um, what? I, I think was well, there a specific date? There wasn't a specific date you mentioned. I like to keep the month um, on my exit scam. Yeah, we have that money, but it will be sometime in 2023. Thank you. Is that answer your question? <laughs> Watch my Twitter feed in 2023. It's Twitter's full of things. We'll all fuck the scene. Yeah, or we'll we'll follow me on Mastodon or whatever it is. Yeah, I don't even know. I got one question. Okay, yes, Bob. Uh, I have a question. I have primarily trade, so I'm not really up to all of it. Has anybody in the crypto sphere thought about what would happen if we ever lost major power at an EMP or even just a massive natural disaster and we had already been on crypto? Yeah. yeah, so the, to, to some degree, that's what blockchain satellite is, um, is, is speaking to. 
um, you know, what happens if the internet in a, major, in a part of the world is disrupted for a significant period of time? Um, you might not be able to transact that easily, but you can at least receive transactions. Also, Samurai um, supports uh, Go to Mesh, and so you can, if you have a Go to Mesh device and there are people around you that do, then you can create a mesh network and you can broadcast transactions on Go to Mesh. And then any of the Go to Mesh devices that happens to have an internet connection, even if it is hundreds of kilometers away, um, your transaction will find its way out into the internet. Um, so, so yeah, I strongly recommend um, they're fun to play with, and it's a good proportionary device to have. Get yourself a GoTel mesh device, and uh, just you know, keep it around, play with it, get a couple, give it to your friends, um, give it to your families. It's really cool. Um, it, it, yeah, it's super cheap. It's um, it, it's really accessible, and it is uh, like if you if you do any hiking. Um, it's a nice way to like keep in contact with the rest of the group if you're hiking. So it like is more useful than just like oh well, one day yeah one day stuff might happen. Um, but yeah, if, if stuff does happen, then then they're probably going to be pretty important devices. Yeah. Cool. What, Last I, question. I, I know you guys know. Um, just uh, what if I can get your comment on um, the recently launched uh, liquid assets on um, for Black Street on their side chain project. I was wondering if you just comment on that. Because I know it's not fully decentralized, it is federated and stuff, but I just wanted to see what, what your thoughts are on it for, or from a security perspective and then from just a regular um, Bitcoin maximum. Uh, so I'm not, a, I'll be honest, I'm not a massive fan of liquid in general. Um, I think that it's nice as a, as a test bed and as a, a cool thing to play with. Um, but I, I just, I think they're trying to, so they're, they're sort of, sort of trying to force utility out of it. Um, they've like spent all this money on it, and now they're like, well, how do we make this thing useful? And and I think that um, that you know, anything institutions, I, you know, I mean, I think that like liquid as a as an underlying way to move money between exchanges, sure, I can buy into that. But like as an asset protocol, I don't think it's that interesting. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it, it's certainly like more interesting than EOS, but. Um, it's more interesting than any of the top ten crack points. Yeah, so. but it's uh, but it's it's definitely like it's not it's just, it just doesn't have much appeal. Cool. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.